Let's have a word of prayer. Most gracious God. <coughs> it is so true how you lead us. And if we are faithful to you as you've been faithful to us, you're going to lead us home. Amen. Thank you. Thank you for your holy presence. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. It is a solemn statement I make to the church that not one in twenty whose names are registered upon the church books are prepared to close their earthly history and would be as verily without God and without hope in the world as the common sense. Now that was then, a long time ago. You know that number's going up. It's a fearful thing. Those who have had opportunity to hear and receive of the truth and have united with the Seventh-day Adventist Church, calling themselves the commandment keeping people of God, and yet possess no more vitality and consecration to God than do the nominal churches, will receive the plagues of God just as verily as the churches who oppose the law of God. That's taken from the last the book, Last State Events, page 172, verses 1 and 2. And so that information raises a question for each of us. Where are we at in our relation with Jesus Christ? Mm -hmm. Amen. Something, yes ma'am, it's something we have to think about. Now. Not tomorrow. And it is a personal question. But our answer must come from our, from our understanding of Scripture and how our, our characters compare to the divine character of Jesus Christ. Are we able, with all confidence, through the Holy Spirit, able to say, Christ lives in me. God has set up and guided us, the Seventh-day Adventist Church, to the present truth that we live in today as his special position. We, his church, the Adventist Church, is the apple of his eye. And he regards it with special care. As his special possession, we have a sacred trust to give back to God, to give back to the world, to give back to ourselves. And that sacred trust is, if you love me, keep my commandments. John chapter 14, verse 15. I say that verse a lot because it means a lot. It means everything. But we were born with a fallen nature. Tended to go against the love of God to do our own thing. Sabbath. I know we all know what Sabbath means, but let's look at a definition. <coughs> the seventh day of the week observed from Friday evening sunset to Saturday evening sunset as a day of rest. Now let us not be clock watchers. So we should give a half an hour each side of the Sabbath to holiness so that we don't become a clock.
clockwise. Sabbath is a joy. It's a wonderful time. Let's look at another definition called Sunday. Observed by Christians as a day of rest and worship. It's a spurious day, a false day. Nowhere in the scripture is it taught that God who wrote the Ten Commandments ever changed it to the first day of the week, Sunday. You can go from cover to cover. It's not there. For it to have been changed, Jesus would have had to change it before he went to the cross. As a test state. Last will and testament. If he hadn't done that, which he didn't, Sunday is illegal by God. In the Great Controversy, page 599. Now understand that I read from the Great Controversy from a 1950 edition. The editions today are less. And so when I give a page, it may not be in the new editions because it's been reduced. My suggestion is, is get the serious conflict of the, of the ages as old as you can get them, where it's not been edited. But Great Controversy 599 states, the Sabbath will be the great test of loyalty. For it is the point of truth, especially contested. When the final test shall be brought to bear upon men, then the line of distinction will be drawn between those who serve God and those who serve him not. Two different understandings of two different days of worship. Wow. Turn with, me, turn with me in the scriptures to 1 Kings, chapter 18, verse 21. 1 Kings, chapter 18, and verse 21. This is about Obadiah, how he meets Elijah, and the conflict on Mount Carmel. First Kings what? First Kings chapter 18, verse 21. And it says, And Elijah came unto all the people and said, How long halt you between two opinions? If the Lord be God, follow him. But if Baal, then follow him. And the people answered him not a word. <laughs> How long call you? Now, if this shoe doesn't fit, don't wear it. If you're convinced of Sabbath or Sunday, do it. God's not going to hold you. How am I going to say that? Well, He's going to give you a reward one way or the other. Mm -hmm. Know which side of the fence you stand on. How long call you? The people of Israel stood at a crossroads. We today stand at that same crossroads as ancient Israel did then. Obeying the word of God found in Scripture, and only in Scripture. Or obeying traditions set down by governments. Would the people of God then reject forever the God who had established them? as a separate people. The question is, will we, as a professed people of God today, reject Him as a separate people? It's the same question. Or would they, and will we, accept Baal as our God? It's not quite a simple answer. 
But, you know, to those long ago and for us today. Satan is deceiving. He's been deceiving us for generations, millennia. It's not an easy answer. Unless you love God. The world we live in today is much different than the world of just 200 years ago. Yeah, that's true. Satan and those who few direct the course or direction of humanity have very successfully handcuffed the world, the entire mm -hmm. world's population, to the need of depending upon resources that are no longer in our control. Wasn't well, all that long ago that men, women, and households could go out and provide for their own sustenance, their own heat, their own shelter. But we become so enamored to society and its supplying our needs that we have lost direction in that. And in losing that direction, we have lost some of our liberties. God never intended that one man's mind or judgment should be a controlling power. Whenever he has had a special work to be done, he has always had men ready to meet the demand in every age. When the divine voice, voice at, has asked, who will go with us? The response has come, here am I, send me. In ancient times, the Lord had connected with his work men of very talents. Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Moses, with his meekness and wisdom, and Joshua, with his very capabilities, were all enlisted in God's service. The music of Miriam, the courage and piety of Deborah, the filial affection of Ruth, the obedience and faithfulness of Samuel, were all needed. And Elijah, with his stern traits of character, God used at his appointed time to execute judgment on Jezebel. And you can read that in the book Reflecting Christ, page 319. The same question comes to us today. Who will go for us? And how long halt you between two opinions? I fear that as God's people were mute to that question then, we are just as mute today. They wish to unite the worship of Yahweh with that of Baal, to avoid breaking with the present truth of righteousness by faith, and yet at the same time hold to the vices of, of, vices of today's world with all of its enjoyments which are sensuous and impure. Or they even hold the job. Even if it requires to break the set. When with the song just sung, he leadeth me, he will lead you to that right job. Where Sabbath can be honored. Where God can be honored. You know, I don't want to tell you, say this about Sabbath work. I dealt with it many years ago. I fought, God fought, we argued, and He won. <laughs> Which is only right. But it took time. It took time. It took experience. It took uh, strength. 
that wasn't mine. He offers that same strength to each of us. Yes. We have to surrender to him. And I've never been happier. Oh, I've had a lot of hard times in between that. But overall, I wouldn't change a thing. While at the same time claiming to be the remnant people of God, we would break the Sabbath. So we can have food on our tables. Warm in our houses. Coolness in the summer. Shelter from the rains. And God says, He will provide. If we will allow it. And I'll tell you the fact of the matter is, is that many times when we are depending on God, He will let us go to the very end of our strength to show us that it's not His strength, but not our strength, but His strength that provides. Amen. And here's another sad thing. If anyone transgresses the law, it is to that person sin. You can read that, 1 John chapter 3, verse 4. And we are told in Romans chapter 6, verse 23, that the wages of sin is death. God has been calling the people ever since sin entered the garden. Will God's people hear and respond to his call in these last hours of mercy? Because brothers and sisters, we're at the end. I don't know exactly when that's going to be, but I have never seen the world as it is today. The America I live in and that you live in is not the America I grew up in. We have lost much, and we're going to lose more. But that's okay because we're going to bring, gain eternity, and not in sleep either in heaven, before our Father, before our Lord Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit. Turn with me to Revelation chapter 18, verse 4. It's a scripture reading. Revelation 18, and verse 4. I find in the scripture comfort. Comfort to know that God cares. cares for each of us in such a personal way that we will never, never fully understand it. Chapter 18 of Revelation, verse 4, and it says, And I heard another voice from heaven saying, Come out of her, my people, that ye be not partakers of her sins, and that ye receive not of her plagues. Almost until the very close of time, some, perhaps many of God's people, have not yet heard God's call to come out, or even more fearful, halt between two opinions, hoping to somehow unite the enjoyments of the world with the worship of God. We all need to understand that in Revelation 18, Babylon, the world, is arraigned as a defendant before the God of divine justice to answer to indictments, charges, and these charges are one, pride and arrogance, two, materialism and luxury, three, physical and spiritual adultery, four, deception, five, persecution. And you can read that in verses 2, 3, 5, 7, 23, and 24. That's what they are. And those who refuse to separate from her will be judged individually with her. God is measuring his church, his people. God is measuring you in your everyday life. When you're at home doing household chores, when you're at work, when you're in conversation, 
when you're driving your vehicle, and I have a lot to answer for that, but God is still working on it. And many other areas of our lives, we are being measured. God is measuring you. Remember, your words, your actions are being photographed in the books of heaven. I don't understand it. I know it's true. This is the work going on. Measuring the temple which you are. Turn with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 3. 1 Corinthians chapter 3. Verses 16 and 17. 1 Corinthians chapter 3. Verses 16 and 17. And it says, Know ye not that you are the temple of God, and that the Spirit of God dwells in you? If any man defile the temple of God, him shall God destroy. For the temple of God is holy, which temple you are. To know God is, in the scriptural sense of the term, to be one with him in heart and mind, having a loving knowledge of Him, holding reverential communion with Him as our Redeemer. Only through sincere obedience can this communion be had. Where this communion is lacking, the heart is not in any sense a temple of God, but is controlled by the foe, our enemy who is working out his own purposes through the human agent. Whoever this word might apply to is not a temple to the Holy Spirit. You can read that in the Upward Look, page 295. But does that mean God's not working with you? No. As long as you are still trying, God will work with you. It's when you quit trying. When that small voice no longer is heard, that you are breathing the Holy Spirit. But He will work with you over and over and over until you do one of two things. Surrender and be victorious or you fall. That's between you and the Holy Spirit. Turn with me to Ephesians chapter 4. Ephesians chapter 4, verses 23 and 24. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 23 and verse 24. This is a work that we need to have done in our own spiritual lives. Verse 23 says, And be renewed in the spirit of your mind, and that you put on the new man, which, after God, is created in righteousness and true holiness. Wrong habits must be overcome. Right habits must be formed. Under the greatest teacher the world has ever known, Christians must move onward and upward toward perfection. This is God's command, and no one should say, I cannot do it. We should say instead, God requires me to be perfect, and he will give me strength to overcome all that stands in the way of perfection. Reflecting Christ, page 164. So if any of us have ever heard that we don't have to be perfect, we need to rethink that position because it's a lie. God asks us, we need to be as perfect, living up to all the light that we have, not thinking it won't matter. God has a standard that he expects his people to adhere to. And that standard is his law of ten commandments. With the fourth being the main point of contention between God the creator and Satan. For the fourth commandment tells us the name, title, and territory of the owner of the universe and all that is in it. The Sabbath points us back to a perfect world and the long ago 
Genesis chapter 1, verse 31, and chapter 2, 1 through 3. And reminds us when the Creator will again make all things new. Amen. Revelation 21, 5. It's also a reminder that God stands ready to restore within our hearts and our lives His own image as it was in the beginning. Genesis chapter 1, verse 26 and 27. He who enters into the true spirit of Sabbath observance will thus qualify for receiving the seal of God, which is the divine recognition that His character is reflected perfectly in the life. Ezekiel chapter 20 and verse 20. It is our happy privilege once each week to forget everything that reminds us of this world of sin and to remember those things that draw us closer to God. The Sabbath may become to us a little sanctuary in the wilderness of this world where we may for a time be free from its cares and enter, as it were, into the joys of heaven. The Sabbath is also one of seven of the pillars to make up God's remnant people. And these are, one, the three angels' messages. Give glory to God. Two, the second coming of Christ and his imminent return. Three, the law of God, ten commandments. Four, the heavenly sanctuary judgment, which we're under now. Five, the seventh day Sabbath. And I want to read a quote out of early writings, page 32 and 33. And it's through this pen that something was revealed to me just recently. She's in vision. And uh, it says, in the holiest I saw the ark. So she's vision in the Holy of Holies. On top and sides of it was purest gold. On each end of the ark was a lovely cherub, with its wings spread over. Their faces were torn, turned towards each other, and they looked downward. Between the angels was a golden censer. Above the ark, where the angels stood, was an exceeding bright glory that appeared like a throne where God dwelt. Jesus stood by the ark. And as the saints' prayers came up to him, the incense and the censers would smoke, and he would offer up their prayers with the smoke of the incense to his Father. In the ark was a golden pot of man, Aaron's rod that budded, and the tables of stone which folded together like a book. Jesus opened them, and I saw the Ten Commandments written on them with the finger of God. On one table were four, and on the other six. The four on the first table shone brighter than the other six. But the fourth, the Sabbath commandment, shone above them all. For the Sabbath was set apart to keep an honor of God's holy name. The holy Sabbath looked glorious. A halo of glory was all around it. I saw that the Sabbath commandment was not nailed to the cross. If it was, the other nine commandments were also. And then, if that's the case, we are at liberty to break any of them. As well as the fourth. I saw that God has not changed the Sabbath, for he never changes. Jesus Christ the same today, yesterday, and forever. But the Pope had changed that from the seventh to the first day of the week, for he was to change times and laws. Number six, state of the dead. They don't know anything. Praise God for that. Number seven, Spirit of Prophecy, which I've been reading a lot today. It's what I always do when I give a sermon. They go hand in hand. Spirit of Prophecy, the testimony of Jesus. These seven pillars are what separates and distinguishes us as God's friendly people. And we should be living our life as witnesses against the teachings and traditions of the Vatican. If we, as a professed people of God, live up to all the light of the truth we have, the people of the world will have a much better chance of coming out of those apostate churches that follow the traditions of men. You know, I've said it many times, that being a Protestant and following Jesus and all the truth 
for this present day is not for the faint, faint of heart. It's not so much that it's hard. You're just going to take a lot of abuse. And that's why so many of us have been seen. And we let it bother us. We need to get thicker skins on us. Because it surely is not going to get any easier. But it is going to get glorious. We need the armor of God. Amen, sister. Right on. We need the armor. I didn't add that. It was in my thoughts, but I didn't. But you're right on. The armor of God. And, you know, if we have that, all the fiery darts that Satan's agents will throw at us, they can't penetrate. We need that armor of God. That's, that's another message another time, I think. It's very true. Those who are true to God in truth are a thorn in the sight of those who are stuck between two opinions. It was no different when Christ walked this world. Yet Jesus, in his integrity and commitment to God his Father, could not be swayed from his allegiance to God and truth. What about you? Are you swayed easily? Where is your life at? There we go. Whose hands has your life in them? God or Satan? Be careful. How healthy is your commitment to Jesus in present truth today? Our founding fathers of 1844 and even a little bit before that is still present truth today. God and his vindication. As God's run the people, we are about to enter the greatest tribulation this world has ever experienced. The signs are all around us. Are we watching and listening? Governments are fighting with each other. False Christs are appearing all over the world. The world itself is in turmoil. Earthquakes, hurricanes, tornadoes, flooding all around the world. Sickness and disease. Thousands of dead fish washing up, up, up on the shore. Birds by the hundreds, hundreds falling out of the air dead. And many other signs are happening around the globe. Are you looking? Are you seeing what's going on? Look at the political arena. What a jumbled mess. If we will only open our eyes and ears to the signs of the times, to the signs of distress. I'll close in a moment. But first, let's turn to Matthew chapter 16, verses 1 through 4. Matthew chapter 16, 1 through 4. And this is where the Pharisees are testing Christ. We are going to be tested in the same areas. Verses 1 through 4 of chapter 16. The Pharisees also, with the Sadducees, came, and tempting desired him that he would show them a sign from heaven. He answered and said to them, When it is evening, you say, it will be fair weather, for the sky is red. And in the morning it will be foul weather today, for the sky is red and lowering. O ye hypocrites, you can discern the face of the sky, but cannot yet discern the signs of the times. A wicked and adulterous generation seeks after a sign, and there shall no sign be given to it, but the sign of the prophet, prophet Jonas, and he left them and departed. You ever wonder about those four verses, what they really get down to? Wicked. They were wicked in the sense that they lacked moral and spiritual perception, thinking that God will forgive because he is a living God. Have you ever heard that in today's word? Oh, God will forgive. He's, he's a loving God. I've heard it many times. But God is a God of justice first. Before he's a forgiving God. Even. The words of Christ, uh, if, if you believe in that, you're deceiving yourselves. Adulterous. 
That is in the sense that they are disloyal to God and obedience, spiritually, spiritual adultery. Calling themselves a commandment keeping people, and yet working around with the world. And that's not exactly the way I wanted to say it. I can't think of the right word. You cannot serve God and them. One has to go. They ask for a sign. And those who halt between opinions are in need of spiritual regeneration from within, not an outward sign. The words of Christ were an impressive sign alone. That should be a sign for us today if we're reading his word. We should need no other sign. The prophet Jonah, as the inhabitants of Nineveh were converted through the preaching of Jonah, those who heard Christ's preaching should have been signing up for them. Patriarchs and Prophets, page 248 through 250. And he left it. What a scary thought. If he were to say, adios to us, because of our habits. There was no further use in speaking to them. They were set in their hypocritical ways, and nothing he said would convince them otherwise. Further discussion would only to serve confuse those who were listening on the outside. Brothers and sisters, that is the very same attitude we live today in this world. And that should be a sign to us of the imminent closeness of the time of trouble that the world has never seen. It is just before us. So how strong is your commitment to the truth? How strongly are you anchored to God as your Savior? Remember Revelation chapter 1 and verse 7, and I will close with this. And I'm not even going to go there. On his return, every eye that has ever lived will see him. When he returns this time, those who pierced him, who crucified him, are going to be raised in a special resurrection. And they're going to see who they crucified, our King, our Lord, our God. And then he will lay them back down. Every eye is going to see him. How strong is your anger? You have to ask yourselves this today. Because tomorrow's not promised to us. That is our closing hymn for the day. Will your anchor hold? Page 534. Page 534. Will your anchor hold?